It is a privilege to be here. I'll bring this up like that. Is that better, better, better Chief? Um, my ears are so floppy, I hate putting things on my ear because it just feels like they're going to fold down and slide off. So I try not to do that. Um, I was thinking that having Chris present his testimony and introduce me was kind of dangerous. My, old, my youngest son was coming to do that and he got sick. So another brother that was coming with us got called into an emergency meeting. I thought about daring to ask Max because Max is my spiritual father as far as I'm concerned, but I was afraid it might have a negative impact on his health. <laughs> and uh, so I was honored that Chris was available to share because um, I love man and I've seen Christ work in his life and working in his life and it's been a privilege. Um, I have to confess, I'm quite humbled to be able to speak at this meeting, the key men's. I've been coming here for a long time. I went to a few key men's up at Red Lodge, Montana when John Crawford went up there because I was in Colorado. Uh, I appreciate Mike Thomas being crazy enough to ask me to do this. Uh, I don't know if he really is aware of what he's done, <laughs> but I'm grateful. I I'm from the land where you work with a fat man, it just means he's fat. Uh, <laughs> that's just what my world is. Uh, I've always appreciated you NAVs with faithful, available, and teachable, or trainable, however you want to end the tea, but Mine have just been fat or skinny or some other thing. and uh, But it's a privilege to be here. I, I think of the men that are here that probably should be here where I am. Max, of course. Um, there's none like him in my life. Uh, I think of Steve Presswood and Steve Moore. Uh, I think of some of my brothers that are here that have earned the right to share because of their life testimony, but I'm humbled to be here with y'all. I, I hope you can understand me okay. I haven't drank in a long time, uh, but Parkinson's does affect my voice at times. I've had Parkinson's for about almost 15 years or 16, and uh, God let me still walk around, so I'm, I'm still pretty grateful. Uh, I have noticed, though, that it affects my eyes leak a lot now. Uh, I'll go watch a commercial or see a dog or a cat and I start dripping. <laughs> and um, it really bothers me. I went to a movie this past week with a friend in our church and his wife and my wife and I cried through it. That, that's not supposed to happen to me. I went to my urologist, my neurologist, <laughs> My urologist couldn't help me. <laughs> but my neurologist just said, you cry a lot. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like I, I have other complications with my Parkinson's. I can't feel my lower legs and I would tell my doctors about it and they would go, mm. It didn't matter which one I went to, my urologist or neurologist, they think. And uh, so I figure a lot of my life diagnosis is, mm. Uh, Paul and I have been in a neck and neck race to see who goes to Jesus first. And our doctors just say, mm. But in all sincerity, I am humbled to be here because of the, the, what this place means to me. I was first invited in the early 80s to come by John Crawford, and we would bring some of our fellows down from the church I pastored up in Tulsa or Sand Springs. Um, this is a holy place to me. Uh, it's not, it's never been the best workshops. I can go to some big churches that put on really good workshops. It's, it's never been the best preaching because you have guys like me doing it. Uh, it's, it's, but it's been unique because it's been like-hearted men not speaking necessarily from their minds and their positions of academia,
but from their hearts. And it's just been a joy to come and rub elbows with like-hearted fellows. Um, I draw some conclusions, though, and I ask you to bear with me. I, I don't have an ax to grind. Uh, I've discovered that fights and war is for young guys. I'm not that anymore. Um, but I have made some observations that I think are worth sharing. Uh, I wonder how you define a key man. What does it mean, mean to be a key man? I remember in the early 80s when I would come, John would ask if you had your, your verses with you. He'd want you to quote your new verse. Gene Moore would be here walking around and he scared most of us. And Gene would have a panel discussion. And I still remember his infamously long answers. No, they were never long, they were short. I remember a man one time in this room said, Gene, I've struggled with lust for a long time. What should I do? And he said, stop. <laughs> Those things are embedded, ingrained in my DNA because of those godly men that walked before us here. Um, Max was always here. He'd bring his staff. He'd bring a bunch of students who probably didn't fully understand what was being done to them, but they were being transformed into faithful men, to key men. I wonder if we define key man the way John did. I wonder if we define being a key man the way Gene did. I wonder if we think about what it means to be involved in investing in the lives of key men the way that Matt thinks about it. So many have gone before us. We have a tremendous legacy here. What are we passing on? In Judges 2.10, it said, and after that generation died, another generation arose that did not know the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. We have a great legacy here. In my own personal journey, what keeps me motivated many times is I think about those that have invested in me Max Barnett loved me. I didn't go to OU, I couldn't even get in the door. Uh, where I did go to college, I was on academic and social probation after the first semester. Uh, I was a troubled child. Uh, the pr pr president of the school told me I was a cultural black hole. <laughs> I had a man at a meeting this past week at our church. He had seen the Jesus Revolution and a special showing. And he said, I finally understand story when he talks about his stupid period. And, but he said, I just can't tell if he's come out of it yet. <laughs> but I am the recipient of men who've gone before that invested me. Max. I was sent by the state of Colorado to a conference in New Mexico. When I got there, the conference had been canceled and another conference had been put in its place, a discipleship conference led by Max Barnett. I was elated because I had gone to school in Oklahoma, not OU, but in Oklahoma, and I had never heard anything good about that guy. And so I couldn't wait to meet him. Uh, because it always bothered me that people talked about him and he wasn't there. And I, I, I'd wonder, why does he bother you? I got to meet this guy. And I had never seen a man so gripped by the word of God before. I'd never seen a man who lived by the principles of scripture like that, who could just speak the word of God. And I remember thinking, 
as I listened to Max teach on multiplication, the Great Commission, and other things, that this is what I've been looking for. I'd come to Christ a couple years, about five years before that, in the Jesus people, and I was just amazed, and I just knew that that was what had been missing in my life, to be a disciple maker all of my life. And I felt called of God to be a disciple maker. But I have concerns. When I was taught to be a disciple maker, it really meant doing the disciples' will as an obedient disciple with Christ in the center of my life, being in the word and prayer and having godly fellowship, being a consistent witness, the obedient Christian life, doing the hand, getting a grip on God's word so his word could get a grip on you. It was so clear to me. Max told me that I needed to memorize verses, so I started memorizing a verse a day. I remember going back to Colorado telling my wife, honey, we're going to get up at five in the morning. We're going to memorize a verse a day. We're going to have quiet times for about an hour. We're going to, and she just, she didn't respond kindly. <laughs> but, I was taught by example that being a disciple meant I'm identified with Christ. That when people would be around me, they would sense Christ. When my life was squeezed or pressured, it would be Christ who would come out. Amen. It was clear to me what being a disciple and a disciple maker was. But it appears to me that some of this has been lost and and please don't hear me grinding an ax against anything, but maybe I am. I am thoroughly educated. I am just educatedly stupid. I've been to seminaries and colleges. And what I find is that they're making an indelible mark on us. And I'm not throwing rocks at them. I believe in them. But what I am making a concerned statement about is some of us are more defined by our theological position than we are about identifying with Jesus. We're more concerned about the last conference we attended, the last book we read, the last commentary series we purchased, the people we quote, than we are what the scripture says. We're more likely to offer a systematic book on theology to a brother that's dealing with forgiveness issues than to ask them if they would memorize a verse on forgiveness. We're more and more sectarian, probably and maybe perhaps worse than the Corinthian church. It grieves me. Part of the reason it grieves me is I'm a part of that. We're people that will argue over anything. We'll argue over first tier theological positions, second tier theological positions, third tier theological positions. And sometimes a good argument's good. Do you realize that you can disagree and grow. You can disagree and be encouraged. You can disagree and become a better disciple because you've learned. But unfortunately, if you're like I tend to be at times, I become rigid. And I understand rigidity because my body's becoming rigid. <laughs> Sometimes when someone disagrees with you, it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means they disagree with you. It's like when we fight over the end times. Fellas, it hadn't happened yet. 
Yeah. Now, I know some of you've got it mapped out and figured out. And some of you just don't really care. You just know you win in the end. <laughs> but yet we'll line up and throw eye barbs at one another, question your pedigree and your dogma, because we identify so strongly. What would happen if we'd be known by our love? What would happen if we would be known? When I used to think of the navigators, I thought of the will and the hand. I thought of Dawson Trotman. Then I discovered as I grew older that not everybody in the, the family liked Dawes. I was shocked because John Crawford and Max Barnett introduced me to Dawes through the book Dawes. How could you not love Dawes? I guess if he was barking up your tree, you may not have liked him. <laughs> but it said something to me so clearly what it meant to be a man who was a disciple, a man of God. What would happen? Just think, dream with me. If we felt it was our job to teach a person how to feed themselves from Scripture rather than us spoon fill, feed them our theology, you'd have to trust God on that one. Mike Thomas called me a few years back and asked me to follow up on a guy. And I said, well, Mike, I don't, he and I are not in the same theological camp. And he said, I know that. But he said, I think you can help him learn just to focus on Jesus. And I was so honored that Mike called me to do that. And we were able to focus on Jesus. What if we focused on Jesus? What if we truly taught and modeled abiding in Christ? I, I think the scriptures are still consistent. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We can abide in him and bear much fruit, but apart from him, we can do nothing. I wonder if we truly believe that. I'm realizing I'm in the last chapters of my life. I understand that. Now, I don't know. They may be long chapters. But the point is, Will I be known as a man who looked like, acted like, carried himself like Jesus? We know in Mark 3, 14, I'm proof texting here, I understand what I'm doing, uh, that he appointed 12 that they might be with him before he sent them out to preach and things, to be with him. And then I'm always marveled when I look at Acts 4, 13, and it said, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and recognized they were common, ordinary men, uneducated men. They marveled, and then they remembered they'd been with Jesus. What if we emphasized being with Christ? What if we trusted the Word of God to instruct our men? Stay with me a little longer. Think for a moment of all the labels we have, all the isms and ists. I've been an ist most of my Christian journey. I do admit I was a charismaniac for a couple years. And then through studying the Bible and through some other things, my ist became more dominant. I became a Christian in 1970, 71, 71. And I was called a Jesus person, a Jesus people. I like that. I called myself a Christ follower. Then I learned as I grew older in the faith that I had to wave my flag. Well, what kind of Jesus people are you? Are you a Baptist? Are you a Methodist? 
Are you a chemist? <laughs> or just go on down the line. I had to wave a flag. And I no longer was a Jesus person. I was no longer a follower of Christ. I had to be defined by something else. What if you were known as a disciple maker? A man who raised up key men. I think back to 82 and 83 when I first came here, that people knew when Gene or John spoke about your key men, they knew what that person looked like. They knew who their key men were. Perhaps just a bit we've changed the criteria. How do you measure what a key man looks like? I've thought, because I got this from Max, and it's never been proven wrong, that the objective of discipleship is to help my key man conform to the likeness of Christ. Not to conform to my likeness. Not to be like Mike but to be like Christ. And I only find that from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit opening my eyes to understand the scriptures through prayer and then through something else. I remember in Colorado one time I was preaching and a guy yelled at me I was a heretic after I got through preaching. <laughs> When I got him to calm down, he explained to me that I was in error because I said this, discipleship is as much caught as it is taught. Have you ever heard that before? Do you believe that? See, what he was saying is you don't catch theology, you're taught it. He again was confusing theology with a relationship with Jesus. Let's make sure we don't confuse that. As I grew older, I realized how it seemed I was always being asked where I stood, as I've already said. Along the way, I've learned some things about my theological position. Maybe you can relate to this. My soteriology is wrong. My eschatology is in error. My missiology is skewed. My ecclesiology is bad, and my hermeneutics are questionable. <laughs> I think I'm flunking the class. <laughs> but the class I don't want to flunk is be identified with Christ. My son's are 47 and 43. My 43 year old son will probably in the next couple of years have to have a heart transplant. He's going through a tough time. One of the highest compliments they gave me as a father was that I'm the same in public as I am at home. That what I've given my life to is helping men walk with God. And that it has had a profound effect on them. What if we go back to the basics of what a key man is? And we worry less about the wording of our soteriology, our ecclesiology, our epistemology, our hermeneutic, our eschatology, and we worry more about, am I modeling Christ? Am I demonstrating to them what it means to be with Christ? If they do what I do, would they experience the peace of Jesus? Do they realize that I am fleshing out, that I can do nothing apart from him? But herein is my Father glorified that I bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciple. All because I abide in Christ. And be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that's based on the law, but that which is through faith, the righteousness of God which is in Christ. That my life is a testimony of what it means to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Apologetics is another pet peeve of mine. Not because I don't believe we need to defend the faith. I just think we need to quit barbecuing Christians. If you're honest, and maybe you are, maybe you are, I don't know you. Do you ever disagree with you? <laughs> I do. And just on a side note, this is a detour. I don't know what's going on in Asbury right now, but I pray it's God. I pray that it's the movement of God's spirit, fresh and new among college kids. And I pray that God will silence the Christian brothers that feel it's their duty to crucify it until we see if it's of God or not. We're so quick to want to fight. and I've been there so much in my life. In my journey, I'm actually past half now, I've been helped by Methodists, Wesleyans, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Assemblies of God, Bible churches, Southern Baptists, and others. I've been blessed. I've discipled Nazarenes, Baptists of many flavors. There's 148 of us. <laughs> Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, and others. We've dealt with doctrine when it was appropriate, but almost always at their request, not my direction. I think I missed the class where I was supposed to guide them to be a solid Southern Baptist or a great dispensationalist or help them to have the correct theological choice. So may I suggest we look at what makes a key man a key man from those who have set the pace. I don't believe any of them wanted us to produce warists. That's a play on Gene Wars listening. I don't think anyone wanted us teaching Crawfordism or raise up Barnettites. I will have to confess, one time I was in another city and this guy introduced me like he knew me, but I'd never met him before, but he seemed to know me. He said, this is Mike's story. He's a Barnettite. I was so proud <laughs> that someone would even compare me to Max Barnett. I mean, I about cried. I really didn't, but I thought I'd say that. I think all of them, past, present, would urge us to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, so what would some of the indicators of the main thing look like? You got a, pa a hand out there, you can just follow along. Now I'm gonna tell you, this is not an exhaustive list. You may not choose mine. But what, is, what are some markers? If we're raising up men that are key men, what does that mean? Well, I think first and foremost, a key man is a person who unapologetically has a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. They know they were in darkness, now they're in light. They were dead and now they're made alive. They were lost and now they're found. They were unregenerated and now they've been made new in Christ. They're a new creation. We need to make sure they know that their sins are forgiven, that eternal life is their inheritance, and they're confident because they have a faith relationship in Christ. They don't hope they do. They don't think they do. They know they do. A key man is one who abides in Christ and identifies with Christ. Do you abide in him? What are you depending on Christ for? What are you depending on Christ? So much that if he doesn't come through, you drown. Now, I'm not talking about dumb business ventures you might embark on. I'm talking about what matters, your life, your soul, your heart. 
Can you add one minute to your life? I've gone to some fine doctors and they all tell me the same thing. You have Parkinson's. Not one of them has told me how to get rid of it. <laughs> now God could heal me. He can. He still does that. He has done that and will do it again. But he's allowed me the privilege of just learning to walk with him and trust him in the process. I must say I'd rather be healed, but we are what we are, and we are where we are, and I'm abiding in Christ because apart from him I can do nothing. Are you identified with Christ? When people think of you, do they think of your theological stance or this guy really loves Jesus? Now, don't hear me minimizing theology. I'm not. There's a place where it's necessary. It's critical. But not when we're talking about laying the foundation in a person's life that needs to be first and foremost the foundation of Jesus and the Word alive and active. I used to have a professor that would come into one of my classes and say, I am the Baptist that knows Bultmann. So I would go up and erase it and write, I know you know Bultmann. Have you heard of the four spiritual laws? He did not appreciate it. <laughs> a key man abides in Christ and identifies with him. A key man is a self-denying, cross-bearing follower of Christ. And he said to them all, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For what have you gained if you gain the whole world but forfeit your own life. It seems to me that we've kind of diminished the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that needs to take place in our lives from what it means to be a key man. We're way too much alive. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, you all know it. Are you living it out? Which means, are you dead men walking? A key man is a self-denying, cross-bearing follower of Christ. Whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.33, do we really believe that? God doesn't want the leftovers. He doesn't want the remnant. He doesn't. He wants you, all of you. And if we don't renounce all that we are, we're not a part of it. A key man is an obedient servant of Christ. I'll tell an old story. I remember when I was in my first cemetery, working on my first cemetery degree, and I was a John boy, that is a custodian, and I was cleaning a urinal. And I was thinking to myself, story, you're really going places in life, son. This is the apex, apex of success. And God spoke to me there in that urinal moment. <laughs> Until you learn the lesson of porcelain, you got nothing to say to anybody. What he was saying, until you have my mind in you and you consider others better than yourselves, I can't use you. In John 13, verse 15 to 17, he said, truly, for I've given to you an example. A disciple is not above his master, but everyone when he's fully trained will be like his master. If you know these things, you are blessed. What did he just modeled for them? He washed the disciples' feet. And if I read the text correctly, he washed a betrayer's feet too. But we're so busy, busy getting my way, our way, the best way, the American way, this way, that we don't even stop to think we're supposed to be dead men walking who have the mind of Christ that focus on the needs of others. I believe it was him serving us that nailed him to a cross. A key man is committed to evangelism and disciple making. 
instead of looking for a fat man, why don't you look for a lost man? Go out fishing for a lost man and see Christ change that man and make him a new man. Then you ground him and make him a key man. And I'm not saying not go get a fat man. We all need diets. But I am saying let's figure out what we need to be about. And that's we are committed to winning people to Christ. And we're committed to grinding, grinding and founding them on the rock of Jesus. A verse that Max had me memorize a long time ago was 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. For we were gentle among you like a nurse taking care of her children. So being desirous of you, we were willing to share with you not just the gospel, but our own selves because you became dear to us. You see, the gospel isn't just slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. I preached at you, and now you have the choice to make. When we share the gospel, we serve them. We follow up on them. We answer their questions. When they become a Christian, we follow up on them. We ground them in the word. We help them become a self-feeder. We help them stand up. We help them become mature. So we present them to Christ mature because we're committed to evangelism and disciple making. A key man is committed to doing the word of God. No one ever called me a legalist before I met Max. But I've noticed if you have a regular quiet time, that bothers some people. If you memorize scriptures, that bothers some people. If you're disciplined and do certain things on a regular way, that's problematic for others. But the real problem is, are you doing the word or just talking about it? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves, James 1.22 says. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I command you? Are we doing the word obediently? My God, as I have been invested in by so many that have gone before me, has done some horrible things to me. He's made me to love some unlovable people. People just like me. Because he loved them. He's had me serve people that I couldn't even stand to be around. Just like some people couldn't stand to be around me. He's had me ask forgiveness from people that I didn't feel I'd done anything wrong to begin with. But that wasn't the point. When we become doers of the word, when we become doers of the word, we simply do what is our duty because we are obedient disciples of Christ. Herein is the love of God that you keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. He that has my commands and keeps my commands, he's the one that loves me. And I will love him, my father will love him, and we will make our home in him and make ourselves known to him. Are you living out, modeling an obedience of action? That's what a key man does. A key man is committed to doing the word. And lastly, into this, a key man is one committed to prayer. How much time do we spend every day in prayer? I've got to pray with Gene War. I still remember praying with John Crawford. I still remember his laugh. <laughs> Grit those teeth and laugh. Just rub his old bald head. Bald is beautiful. <laughs> I affirm on my bald brothers in here, may your flag fly boldly. <laughs> James tells us there's great power in the effect of a righteous man in prayer. 
John 15, 7 says, as we abide in him and his word abides in us, we can ask whatever we wish and it'll be done. Because our hearts are transformed, our minds are transformed, we know what his will is, we know what his way is, and we pray the things that are on his heart, and we have them. God gives them to us. Are you seeing lives change? I was at Matt Holland's workshop today. He's crazy. <laughs> that young man believes if he prays that God will honor his word and goes out and shares the gospel, he, he actually believes God will do that. Amen. <laughs> he needs to grow up. <laughs> he needs some seasoning to realize that God doesn't usually answer our prayers. <laughs> Yes, he does. If we abide in him, if we obey him, if we live in him. He learns that it is by prayer that the power of God is manifest. Victory is received. I look at prayer as the point of faith spear, giving us confidence and hope. The key man realizes that through prayer we experience the presence of God. His promises become our reality and it allows us to enter the land of his peace. A key man is a man of prayer. I've prayed a bunch with Max Barnett because I've traveled a lot of miles with that man. You'll be driving down the road and he'll say, let's pray. And we start praying. Then he'll say, let's review verses. And he doesn't usually say it. He'll just say, "We're gonna. I'm, I'm going to review verses, pull your pack out or something. I think he'd even really try to do that if he was driving, but we don't let him do that. How do I know Max is a man of prayer? Because I've prayed with him. How did I know John Crawford was a man of prayer? Because I prayed with him. And I usually didn't pray much. I just kind of sat there. I mean, I was just a young pastor, a puppy sitting next to these giants. Well, I'm on my very last sheet. Couldn't come too soon. I realized there could be other markers. It could be faithful. It could be disciplined. It, it could be so many things. A good parent, a loving husband. There are a lot of markers, but those are the seven I picked. It's not exhaustive. But those are the things I heard as I remember back from John and Jean, from Jim Downing. Now, I do confess, when I heard Jim one time, we were sitting right over there, a group of students from Oklahoma State, OU. Someone said, Jim, what's the most important thing when you begin dating? He said, physical attraction. <laughs> He said, if she's not attractive, you'll never date her. <laughs> or something like that. I thought, this guy is unbelievable. He came to Oklahoma State and we said, what's one of the hardest things about getting older? And he said, drooling. <laughs> Those are some of the tidbits I remember from Jim Downey. But he was a key man. Winning people to Jesus up to his death. A key man may be a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, an Assembly of God, a Nazarene, or some other fellowship where God's word is taught, where God's word is practiced. But the main thing is they're identified with Jesus. To the key man, it isn't the ism or the ist he's identified with, and we all are, but rather the fact he's in Christ, abiding in Christ, crucified with Christ. If this is applied, we can disagree over certain doctrines, but we will agree on the main things. The key man has one singular focus, which is to be identified with Christ and conform to his likeness. He's a churchman who doesn't think his particular church has it all figured out. Nor does he pretend that they have all the answers. 
I'm a Southern Baptist. Not ashamed of being a Southern Baptist. Don't like all that we as Southern Baptists do, never have, never will. Even if I agree with it, I still disagree. Because I'm just a rebellious kind of guy. But I'm one by choice. Some of you are good Methodists, some of you are good Lutherans, some of you are good Presbyterians, some of you are good Baptists, some of you are good Assembly of God. And I'm using the word good because you're a disciple maker, a key man in the context of that church. We don't pretend that our church has it all the answers, but we're confident Jesus does. We're unapologetically committed to Jesus as the perfect foundation and the only author and finisher of our faith. I was told when I was a young man, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a Southern Baptist today a lot because of Max. I mean, y'all just don't understand the influence that man has had on my life because he loved me. I, I never had a guy just love me before. My father, I was close to, he was an old man. I didn't fit the description of an old man. And um, he told me when he thought I was gonna become a preacher, he said, I knew you'd just be a loser. And when I was older and had started a church in Denver, he said, I knew that you're just a loser. But that was my dad, but I, I still loved him. But Max adopted me and would write me a card about once a, a month just to encourage me. And, and I think, wow, I'm not a Texan and I didn't go to OU. And he's writing me these encouraging letters. Always challenged me, sent me a verse to memorize, told me to get certain, certain tapes that changed my life. His desire, the desire of a key man is to live in such a way as to be an example of Christ's conduct and character. When you're squeezed, does Jesus come out? When things are tough, does he show up? A key man isn't a perfect man, but he's a man who wants Christ to perfect him. He doesn't have all the answers, but he knows the one that does and he seeks him. He's a man who loves what Jesus loves and touches those whom Jesus touch. He's a learner, a follower, a man who daily denies himself and follows Christ. He cares and loves deeply and prays fervently. I am so grateful. I would, when John Crawford was alive, I'd get these cards from him that had been praying for me. Gene Moore would tell me, Padre, if there's anything you need, you just let me know. I'm praying for you, son. Last time I saw Gene alive, he was sitting on that back row there. Alzheimer's was taking its toll, but he was still there. A key man has a tough hide, but a tender heart. He cares and loves deeply and prays fervently for his man or men. He realizes his life at its longest is short. You do understand that, don't you? That's why the psalmist in 9012 of Psalms says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Mm -hmm. James 4:14b, what is your life? You are but a mist that appears for a little time, then vanishes. My dad died at 96. My mom was almost 90. And I asked my dad, is it true, Dad, that time goes by much faster the older you get? He said, oh, son, it's flying by. Isn't it amazing when we're young, it never gets fast enough, it just drags. Now in my 70s, I have to confess, it's spinning pretty quickly. It's spinning faster and faster. But I'm okay with that. For I know whom I have believed and then persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Key men invested in me and I've been raising up key men. In conclusion, the key man has one ultimate aim when it's all said and done to bring glory to Christ. 
I was told a long time ago that I would never go far in Southern Baptist life by some people who seemed to know what they were talking about. And I thought that was funny because I don't really care to. <laughs> but I really do want to be found faithful to Jesus. The key man is an unworthy servant simply doing his duty because he loves the one for whom he does it. May I suggest the following mission statement, life principle, that was passed on to me by Max Barnett, <clears throat> and I've made it my own for you to consider. <clears throat> to know, love, and glorify Christ to be used by him to raise up qualified disciples in significant numbers to help fulfill the Great Commission as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. You can put Kim in, in the phrase where it says disciples. But that helps me. I want to give my life to knowing and loving and glorifying Christ and raising up key men who will do the same to help as best I can, if it matters or not, I do not know, but to work towards the ending of this world through the fulfillment of the Great Commission for the glory of God. This is a key man to me, and I pray that we may be such men and produce such men. Men, it is important what we believe but it may be more important who we are totally identified with. It may be much more important that people see Christ in you than where you stand on certain issues. Christ alone. Let me pray for you. Father, I am just an unworthy vessel fit for nothing. But by your grace, I am what I am. I am so humbled to be here, to look out and see my friend Steve Presswood, Steve Moore, and so many others. To see some of the young men that are working with the navigators that I got to be partners with in the journey of growing. To see your hand in so many lives, molding and sculpting and shaping them to be like Christ. Father, my prayer is that not only do we understand what a key man is, we will be one. But we won't just be one and hoard it and keep it to ourselves. We will earnestly look for men we can help become key men who do the same. Jesus, thank you for using people like me. And I confess and realize that apart from you, I can do nothing. But I also know that with you and in you and by your hand, all things are possible. Take these men and glorify your name through them. Exalt Jesus because of them. Bless Mike Thomas for putting this camp together, for his graciousness, for his hand of trust and fellowship. Thank you, Father, for these men that were here and are so attentive. May they become more like Jesus every single day. And I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.